Hi everyone, my name is Naeem Culver and I'm Extension Soil Health Specialist for NDSU out of Langdon Research Extension Center. I'll talk about uh, briefly regarding some soil health challenges related to soil salinity and uh, sodicity of our producers are facing, not just in Northeast North Dakota, but throughout the state. Uh, these are some of the common questions uh, which we received during the 2020 CAFE talks, and it all boiled down to four main questions. And they are here. Number one is how to deal with different concentration of salts uh, or salinity, managing sodicity, including the use of uh, soil amendments like beet lime and gypsum, drain tile, where do salts go when infiltration is improved or when tile is added? So what I'll do, I'll try to answer each question by giving you some background and uh, some suggestion how to deal with these problems. If we look at the background of uh, soil salinity as well as soil sodicity, these issues are not really new to North Dakota. Um, here is a picture of a very old um, NDSU extension publication, which was reprinted in 1967. And the title for that presentation is Salt Affected Problem Soils in North Dakota. And that presentation mentions that in 1967 or even before that, there were about 1 million acres affected by high levels of water soluble salts. So that means saline acres and 2 million acres which were affected by soil sodicity. So again, just to re-emphasize that these problems are not really new to us. The recent citations, which was done in 2010, mentions about 5.8 million acres, which were affected by high levels of uh, water-soluble salts or soil salinity. And it, this, this citation doesn't talk about soil sodicity. Now, if we look at 5.8 million acres, or if we just round it off to say 6 million acres, that's about 15% of our total cropland in North Dakota, which is about 39 million acres. So we're talking about a uh, big chunk of land of our, out of our cropland. Here are some dollar amounts for planting a spring wheat, canola, corn, and soybean. And these are provided to us by NDSU projected crop budgets for Northeast North Dakota. Now these are 2019 numbers, um, but I think that these would be very close to 2020 crop budgets. Um, I just wanted to use this, uh, these numbers as a reference to show it to you that how much money we are spending just at the time of planting these four crops. So spring wheat costs us about 111 bucks just at the time of planting. Canola 154 bucks, corn 187 and soybeans $82 per acre. That is fine if we have soils which would support these crops. But if you look at this picture, which is um, of a headland, which is slightly east of Langdon, and the farmer planted canola there. The average planting cost of canola per acre was $154 or $155. So on this hand, that headland, that, that money producers spent on seed fertilizer and uh, fuel, that is a net loss. Uh, we won't be able to get any profit, rather we lost money there. Another example of a poor soybean um, headland. Uh, even though the cost of planting soybean is slightly less than canola, but still that $82 basically are down the drain. So what we are trying to say here that um, if we reduce these losses, that will also turn into a profit as well as 
uh, the land will improve. Now, if we, if we look at the most significant negative effect of water-soluble salts or soil salinity is that excess water-soluble salts compete with plant roots for water. Plant roots are trying to pull the water molecules towards them they are as if there are high levels of salts in the soil water, they would try to keep the water in the soil. And the result is drought stressed plants. So that's, that's the most significant impact of soil salinity on plants. So soil salinity directly affects plants or crops. How should we deal with um, these um, high levels of salts or concentrations. Number one thing is to know the level of water soluble salts or soil salinity. Um, luckily, we do see some visual symptoms of soil salinity, like in shape of white salt crust, but sometimes we don't see that, but the problem is there. But that doesn't tell us that how high um, are the salt levels, which crop we should plant. So the best thing is, to take soil sample. And for that, we'll have to zone the problem areas. And by zoning, I mean, for example, some areas may support some crop growth. Some areas may not support any annual crop growth, but uh, weeds may grow like kosher or foxtail barley. Some areas, even those obnoxious weeds won't grow. So we have to zone them and take separate samples, uh, three to four feet deep in 12 inch increments. So uh, we go a little bit deeper uh, when, it, when we are sampling saline sodic soils um, compared to say when we are analyzing the soils for fertility like 0 to 6 inch, 6 to 24. The reason being that because salts, if they are high, um, say in the third foot, they could still come in the first two feet of soil of it, um, either a shallow groundwater depth or with the capillary water, vic, they can vic towards the top soil. And also just to simplify, we just separate the depths in 12 inch increments. So we'll take separate sample from each zone and we take se several cores and um, just to make um, a composite sample, which is representative of that zone. And then we'll give each sample an ID, send them to the lab and ask for electrical conductivity, which is the test to assess soil salinity. we want the lab to analyze that sample for electrical conductivity because there's one-to-one -one which uh, normally gives us a lower value where as there's another method which is saturated paste extract method that gives us at least twice uh, the value uh, uh, for the uh, EC if we use that method compared to one-to-one. -to -one. So method is also very important. And then based on soil EC, we should establish a suitable vegetative cover. Uh, and by that, we will reduce evaporation and then the plant roots will use up some water and soil health will start improving. And then we should also have a plan to lower groundwater depths and improve soil water infiltration. Because for example, if we have a very shallow groundwater depth, uh, say one or two feet below the surface, um, salts will leach and then they'll just remain there and then they'll wick back in the topsoil. Here's an example there, uh, we just created five different zones. So for example, if you look at the red triangle, there is some white area. If you're worried about that white area, then take cores, however many, depending upon the size of the area, three, four, five, but don't mix the soil from the gray areas because gray areas seems like they are producing good crops. So if you mixed good area with the bad area, you'll get average. You won't get a clear picture of what's going on in that white area. And then once you do that, you will make that sample representative of that red triangle. Uh, separating the depth is also very important. It gives us a p clear picture that what's going on in the first 12 inches compared to say in the second, third or fourth uh, uh, feet of soil. And here in this picture, we have four buckets. So we are separating depths from each core. So for example, if we took one sample, we'll be left with four depths or four subsamples uh, for that main sample. 
And then when we are sending the samples to the lab, uh, we not only have to tell them about the test, but the methods as well. So electrical conductivity is the test for the uh, soluble salts. Sodium adsorption ratio, for example, is a common method to assess soil sodicity, soil pH. And personally, I prefer the saturated paste extract uh, method uh, because th that method uh, gives us results which are very close to the field conditions. I would like to also mention a very important soil property, uh, which is uh, cation exchange capacity or CEC. Uh, there are again two methods to analyze this property. One is summation or addition method, which will give us artificially high values, especially when we have high salt levels. And when we take samples from these problem areas, oftentimes we have high salt levels. The other one is the sodium saturation and ammonium extraction method. This is the method which will give us the true soil CEC. And it's very important to get the true soil CEC, especially if we have a sodicity issue and we want to calculate the rates of soil amendments like gypsum. Higher will be the CEC, higher will be the amendment rate we'll get, even though that may not be needed. If we look at this, uh, soil result. Uh, this result here um, uh, shows us two different CEC values for the same sample analyzed by the same lab. So the first CEC is through the summation or addition method, and that is 50.6 milliequivalent per 100 gram. And then the same lab analyzes the same sample for CEC through sodium saturation method, the result is 16.8 milliequivalent per 100 gram. So the summation or addition method gave us roughly three times higher CEC number. So that is not the number you would like to use when you're calculating the rates of the amendments. You wanna use the true CEC. So to, in order to avoid the confusion, it's always better to just tell the lab what you want. And if you just quickly look at uh, the issue of um, water soluble salts, so our EC, which is mentioned as millimoles per centimeter through one to one method is 3.43, whereas the saturated paste EC is 6.5. So I just wanted to quickly show you that these results can greatly vary depending upon the method um, used to analyze these soil properties. Um, this is a table which I borrowed from our newest um, publication, which uh, is the revision of the old managing saline soils in North Dakota, which we revised in last October. And this basically table shows us the salt tolerance levels of different um, crops. So if we look at our annual cash crops, barley, oats, and sugar beets are the most salt tolerant annual crops. If we cannot grow these crops, then we have exhausted our options for planting annual crops. So for example, uh, by the way, these EC values are um, measured as one-to-one -one method. So for example, we'll lose 50% of barley yield and the soil EC, one-to-one -one EC is gets to six millimoles per centimeter. So if we have, I've, I won't even go to that level, I would say our EC levels of one to one are four or five, uh, then I would just not plant the annual crop because saving the money, which we'll be spending on seed fertilizer and fuel just at the time of planting, to me that would be a saving. And then on top of it, um, these, there would be a poor stand, so that means there would be more evaporation and waking up of soil water, which will again uh, increase the levels of water soluble salts in the topsoil. So we are not going to be helping the soil either. Here is a table again from the same publication, which uh, shows us the salt tolerant uh, levels of uh, perennial grasses. Not all perennial grasses are salt tolerant, but if you look, uh, the grasses I really like are tall wheat grass, slender wheat grass, uh, western wheat grass, uh, green wheat grass, the variety is AC salt blender and Russian wild rye. They're very salt tolerant and they will grow where nothing else will grow. Just as a heads up that uh, AC salt blender is a mix of bunch and quack grass. So if you're close to a native pasture, you should avoid that. 
Um, if you have the option to kill it with Roundup, it'll, it'll be killed. And um, that's a very good salt tolerant crab. These grasses also will provide a, a okay to good quality hay, depending upon the time of the cut. So you could hay them or you could get them grazed. So they can also provide you with some income. Just as an example, here's a picture of our Langdon REC tile project site, uh, which was tiled in July of 2014. And I took the picture in April 2015. And just to be fair, um, salts and sodicity problem don't just go away in one or two years, even if we tile. Uh, so I'm not trying to say here that uh, tiling didn't do anything. Um, but the, look, you can look at the picture and see how, how bad this site is. So we applied the soil amendments, a long-term research trial. We are learning new things from it. But we applied the amendments in July and August of 2015 and then I planted and the salt tolerant perennial mix in uh, September of 2015. And here is how the site looked 13 months later. And um, if you could talk to people around Langdon, they would tell you that this site is very problematic. And I'm not trying to say that um, just by having this grass growing, we have fully reclaimed this site, but it's way better than what it used to be. Another example, um, this producer, slightly west of Langdon, planted um, a salt tolerant alpha alpha in 2012 on three acres because he has livestock as well as he plants crops. Nothing grew, so we took some soil samples and he replanted the perennial grass mixed with alfalfa. alpha. And here, here's how the stand looked in 2017. And you could see that the, he didn't apply any amendments, even though there was probably a little bit of need, but he just planted the grass mix along with alfalfa and you could see that the grass is growing everywhere. But the alfalfa is growing wherever the salt levels are lower, the conditions are conducive for alfalfa. So, but he got something out of that land. Now, if I quickly share with you some soil results and what I want you to focus on are soil EC levels. So we took some samples in 12, 14 and 17 from the areas where there was no alfalfa that as well as areas where there was good alfalfa. So wherever there was good alfalfa, you could see that the EC levels, and these are by the way, saturated paste extract EC levels. The, alf or the EC levels, wherever there was good alfalfa growth were less than two. And the, wherever there was no alfalfa, the EC levels were five or more. So even though it's not a replicated trial, the replicated research trial, but I would say that this is something which is very telling to me so that, um, for example, as soon as the saturated paste EC tri uh, gets to about three and a half or four, I would question planting alfalfa on its own. Now, when we plant alfalfa with uh, perennial salt tolerant grasses, that's a different story because we have learned that these grasses somehow nurture alfalfa. So if we look at uh, the yields, hay yields of the uh, producer fields, so we planted a mix of salt tolerant perennial grasses along with uh, some alfalfa seed in 2012. It was basically a replanting on three acres. Grasses took about one to two years to establish. Alfalfa established after three years. And we have seen the same thing going on at the Verlangdon Research Center extensionist strips. Alfalfa took three years to get established. So something is good is going on. Uh, these grasses seem to be very complementary towards alfalfa, for example. Uh, they're kind of like our nurturing alfalfa. So somehow alfalfa seed remains dormant and then the grass it germinates here and there and then the grasses germinate and they develop roots, they reduce evaporation. Roots create channels for the water to move, improve soil water infiltration. Salts leach out a bit from the top six inches, for example, and then alfalfa suddenly starts just getting germinating. And, and, and after germinating, plants are more tolerant to salts, for example, compared to say, for example, at the time of germination. So, um, and then that increases the quality of the hay too. And alfalfa is a taproot plant. It again will help with creating these uh, channels for the water and air to move through the soil. 
layers. So in 2014, the producer got uh, um, three 1,200 pound hay bales, 15 four hay bales, 16 five hay bales, 17 and 18, he got five hay bales despite drier weather. Langdon REC, we have our own share of problem spots. Um, we have planted the same grass mix um, on different areas, but this is an example of one field, which is about 15 acres. We were also losing a lot of money by planting um, annual crops there. So in 2014, we planted uh, these 15 acres into that uh, perennial salt tolerant grass mix by using eight pounds of all five grasses per acre seeding rate and in 15 we got about 30 hay bales out of these uh, 15 acres and um, uh, I'm not 100% sure if, whether each hay bale was 1500 pounds but it was close to it they were very heavy so roughly um, these grasses produce close to 3,000 pounds of biomass per acre um, in 2015. 16 was um, a two bit vet for us to Hey, and after that, we have been mowing um, these grasses because we do not have a lot of uh, livestock around Langdon, unless somebody needs help. Now, um, second question, managing sodicity and then beet lime and gypsum. So I'm just gonna quickly differentiate sodicity versus solidity. If you look at the bottom of the slide, um, there is, um, uh, example of a salt table salt sodium chloride so sodium and chloride both are chemical ion with positive and negative charges when they come together they, when they attract each other with their positive and negative charges they form a salt together on their own they're just chemical ions um, and sodicity is caused by sodium which is attracted to the negative charges of soil particles like clay and humus sand and silt doesn't have any negative charges so um, that's where the soda city is caused. Sodium plus clay is not a combination of both chemical ions. It's a combination of chemical ions getting attracted to a soil particle. So as long as sodium remains as a salt, it will cause salinity, it will compete with plant roots for water, but it will not cause sodicity effects like dispersion or breaking down of soil aggregates. It is also true that if we have high levels of sodium-based salts in the soil water, there's a constant exchange going on between the soil water and the soil exchange sites um, for ions. So more ion, sodium ions can get absorbed or attracted to the negative charges of soil particles, but as long as sodium remains a salt, it will not cause dispersion or sodicity effects. It will cause salinity uh, effects. So here's a here's a picture rough diagram of a soil aggregate and there are tiny soil clay particles which are providing negative charges or surfaces which are attracting positively charged ions and you could see when too many of these negative charges or surfaces attract ions like sodium that leads to the formation of sodium plus clay and then sodium plus clay starts breaking away from these aggregates and this is what happens. Um, the soil aggregates break down and then become very small in size and soil um, is kind of like uh, in dense layer. These particles settle in dense layer, the pore size shrinks. Um, the water either sits there or will run off and there would be very poor soil water infiltration, permeability, uh, poor seed bed um, for planting crops, um, poor seed germination, there would be all sorts of problems. I'm just gonna quickly show you an example of a typical sodic soil result. So these are three soil samples and um, four feet deep. And if you just look at the SAR numbers, um, by the way, NDSU research suggests that if uh, SAR is five or more, and if the soil EC is less than two, um, then we will have some sort of dispersion and swelling, especially when it comes to shrinking and expanding type of soils, which we mostly have in North Dakota. So uh, if we look at the numbers, they are like 37, 30, 16, 27. These are very high levels we are talking about. And I wanna quickly also mention, if you just look at the individual calcium levels compared to say sodium, you will see that um, 
sodium levels are way too high compared to calcium. So units are the same, for example, milligram per liter, so we won't focus on that. If you look at the numbers for section six, zero to 12 inch depth, calcium uh, level is 20.53 and sodium levels are 167.36. Now that's not what we wanna see. We, we wanna see the opposite trend. So roughly, it's very important that calcium should be the dominant ion or cation in our soil chemistry. We wanna see roughly calcium even two, three times more than magnesium. And when it comes to sodium, I don't know, I'm just throwing a rough number four or five times more. If you have the calcium as a dominant ion in your soil chemistry, we will not have dispersion. We may still have salt issue, but we will not have dispersion or sodicity or even high magnesium levels compared to calcium sometimes can lead to dispersion. So we will not have any dispersion, any breaking down of soil aggregates. So how should we deal with sodicity? Again, we'll come back to the same principles we mostly use for soil salinity. Zone the problem areas, take three to four feet um, composite soil samples and separate the depths in 12 inch increments. Ask the lab to test their samples for sodium absorption ratio by clearly indicating the method, which in this case, I personally prefer uh, saturated paste extract method. And based on soil SCR, apply calcium amendments, amendments um, which would add calcium to the soil. So remember from the previous slide, if we would not have lower calcium levels compared to sodium, we will not have the sodicity effect. So if we have, now know there's low calcium levels compared to sodium, the basic purpose of these amendment is that you apply them, you spread them, mix them in into the soil, and then with water they get dissolved and the uh, calcium gets released. Uh, from, for example, sodium uh, gypsum, which is um, calcium sulfate, and it goes and replaces sodium from the soil particle exchange site, and it promotes soil particle aggregation or flocculation, which is the opposite of dispersion. And then we also have to practice salinity management um, um, guidelines, for example, lowering the groundwater depths and improving soil water infiltration, which will happen when we apply the soil amendments because that would be the chemical aggregation of soil particles. There are amendments which supply or add calcium to the soil directly like gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, lime, which is calcium carbonate or calcium chloride salt. Lime, by the way, has very low solubility and it's only effective if soil pH is lower than five. And there are some amendments like elemental sulfur, sulfuric acid, which create indirect um, effects and help remediate sodicity. Um, I personally would not prefer elemental sulfur because um, it's very expensive, uh, even the wholesale rate. And then uh, elemental sulfur needs to convert into sulfate and then sulfuric acid to do that. So it's a long chain of reaction. It takes longer time and it's more costly. Here's an example of gypsum, which is being produced in the western part of a very state and it's in powder form. Powder form gypsum, by the way, it would be better as an amendment compared to palleted farm. Um, it will get dissolved quicker, so it will produce results quicker, and it would be cheaper. Here is an example of beet lime produced by American Crystal Sugar. And uh, we, we applied these products at the Langdon RDC tiling project sites. Now, if you look at the pros and cons of gypsum versus beet lime, they both are direct sources of calcium and um, they could be cost effective depending upon your location. So if your land is somewhere in the east, close to Drayton or Grand Forks, um, it's all about transportation costs. So it would be very cheap for you to apply beet lime. Um, and then if your land is around Washburn and Bismarck, it'll be very cheap for you to haul or get the gypsum hauled and uh, bring it to your land. If you're around Carrington or somewhere in the Benson County, then you're kind of like in the middle, so the cost would be the same. The bottom line is it's all about your location because it's all about transportation cost. Um, and the differences are that gypsum is way more soluble than beet lime, and that would mean that it will take less water and time to get dissolved and remediate the land, and it will not affect your soil pH. Beet lime, on the other hand, uh, will increase your soil pH and obviously it's way less soluble than gypsum. 
Um, even though wheat lime increases soil pH, but due to the buffering capacity of the soils, the pH may come back in two to three years. Now drain tile. There has been a lot of focus on that and drain tile will work as long as we have access soil water. I'm, I'm excluding the landscape for now. Um, I'm just focusing on the uh, basic things from the soil's perspective. So we got to have access soil water and then we got to have good soil water infiltration. And that would mean no dispersion, no breaking down of soil aggregates. It's not suitable even if we have access soil water, but we have poor soil water infiltration. And that would be basically due to moderate to severe dispersion. And we got to solve that problem first before we tile the land. Because if we don't, we will not get good drainage despite investing money on tiling. And here is a picture of our Langdon REC tiling project site, which was taken on July 17, 2014, and the tiling depth is four feet below the surface. So the four feet of soil sitting on top of the um, tile need to have good soil water infiltration so that when it rains, the water can, excess water can, gravitational water can move through the soil layers and tiles can collect it and remove it. Can tiling work without soil testing? Now, what I mean by soil testing, I'm not talking about soil texture analysis, which mostly tiling companies do in order to check uh, the soil texture class and then they decide what's, um, what should be the spacing between the tiles and what should be the diameter of the pipe, whether should, they should have a sock over the tile or not. What I'm talking about is analyzing the problem is spots for um, soil salt levels, soil sodicity levels, and maybe CEC. And the reason for that is that we will tile the areas where we have shallow groundwater tips. Our groundwater is a high um, in salts and, and sodium. So if we have persistent shallow groundwater depths close to the surface during most of the growing season for some time, we are bound to have some excess salt issues and excess sodium or magnesium issues compared to calcium. So it's essential to have these um, areas tested and it would be a tiny cost compared to investing money on uh, tiling. So this is a prime example. This site was tiled, I think, in 2010 or 11. I wasn't here at that time. And it was tiled uh, from the headland, the edge of the headland, the roadside ditch. It goes, I think, 125 feet um, on the south. And it goes all the way up to the third electric pole you see on the east side and then there's a ditch which goes towards the southeast and then water drains there and it has a slope a very good slope starting from the west towards the east where the trees are so it should it has perfect condition tiles wet weather and um, it was considered as a saline spot so there was nothing there which could have prevented getting these uh, the site um, reclaimed from salinity only and um, unfortunately, it wasn't checked for sodicity. Uh, so finally, in 2013, we, we, we took some samples and we realized this site was actually um, 13. Oh, sorry, it was actually um, sodic. And then we started thinking about applying the amendment. This picture, by the way, I took um, in 2014. So when we realized the site was sodic, we wanted to apply the amendments, but we didn't have the full funding. So what we did, um, the site had um, distinct uh, gradients. For example, east was the worst, followed by the west, and center was kind of like uh, better than the other two sites. So we created small plots, four small plots on east side, four small plots in the center, four small plots on the west, and then we hauled beet lime on our own. We bought some gypsum, elemental sulfur, and then we had four treatments on each side, east, center, and west. Uh, on one treatment, we didn't apply anything. On one, we applied beet lime, one gypsum, and one elemental sulfur. We did that in October of 2014. Now, this picture is from 2015, and amendments, again, do not just start producing results in one or two years, depending upon the moisture condition and evapotranspiration. But 2018, 
we observed that there we did the small plot research, those plots that started supporting the annual crops because the producer plants the crops over uh, this area. Last year, it seemed from a distance, if you're driving um, on the highway, which is Highway 17, you, you probably would say that, oh, this site has fully reclaimed. But when you, I actually walked through their spots and I realized that the crop was doing very good um, there. We did a small plot research, but there were still some bald spots in between. But I want to emphasize that we applied these amendments in October of 2014, and we started seeing some good growth in 2018. Um, and, and so there was four years, and last year those plots were doing good five years. So it, it takes some time, depending upon, again, the moisture conditions. And I want to quickly point out something. So we took some soil samples um, from the east center and west side in 2013 and then 15. So if you just focus on the soil sodicity results of the um, east side, first zero to six uh, inch depth, SAR was 13.77. In two years, that SAR of 13 increased to 53. So the site actually got worse. The six to 24 inch depth um, SAR increased from 10 to 46. So leaving these areas, despite tiling, this site was tiled. And it's not the fault of tiles. It's just the imbalance between calcium versus sodium in this example. Salt levels also went um, double because when you have poor soil water infiltration, then uh, what, salts are just going to sit there, and and again there would be um, if there is uh, more evaporation that can lead to more wicking up of soil water. So salt levels also increased, but it was a sodicity which which increased dramatically, and and that's not good because then you will basically need to apply more amendments. And the last question is, where do salts go when infiltration is improved or when tile uh, is added? So the picture on the left is Chris Augustine's picture, and that was taken during our 2014 soil hull tour in Langdon. We had two soil pits, and so one of the pits was in an alfalfa strip. So when you, when you improve your soil water infiltration, which in this case alfalfa roots did, the salts will go into the deeper depths of the soil. On the picture, in the, in the picture on the right, um, this is a uh, pumping station, which is pumping the water out of the tiling project site. If we add tile and if we have good infiltration and the salts get dissolved and leach with the excess water, then the salts will go wherever the excess water is draining, wherever you are draining it, down the road or wherever. So that's the difference. When you improve infiltration, the salts will move downwards. Then you add the tile, whatever would come into the water will go wherever the excess water is draining. So that's all I have um, for this presentation. And with that, um, if there would be any questions, I can uh, take those now. I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. Um, and I hope I was able to um, bring these points across. I'm not against tiling. I want to emphasize on that bit, but we are what we are learning from our tiling project that, you know, even the salt issues. In 16, we reduced salt levels drastically compared to 14, which was the year when we tiled the site. But 17 and 18, the weather was dry here. So salt levels actually increased in 17 and 18 compared to 16, despite the site being tiled. So, um, and that was because of the wicking up of soil water. And plant roots can intercept the wicking up the water. Tiles only collect the free gravitational water. So there's a question, I think, couple. So have you seeded grasses into alfalfa after alfalfa has been established? No, uh, we, it was basically the grass mix and we just included um, the alfalfa at the time when we were planting the grasses. 
So grasses and alfalfa were planted at the same time. What is the best size of best size of gypsum? If pal oh okay type. If palleted, okay, I, I just don't understand the word size. It would be the quantity, I think you may be wanting to. Brian, if you wanted to clarify your question, you could again either unmute or. So number one, I wanna say something, palleted gypsum, there are a couple things um, you should consider in your mind. Number one thing which we look at when we are applying gypsum is purity, because that would affect your rate. So for example, your recommendation for 100% pure gypsum is five tons. Now you are getting a gypsum which is 80% pure, you will have to increase the quantity. So always look at the purity first and then the cost. Now pelleted will produce the same results, but pellets will take some time to get dissolved. So as an amendment, powder form is better. Remember that gypsum the calcium which will be released from the gypsum has to react with soil clay particles, which are tiny. We cannot see them with our eyes. So the finer form would be better. That product will have more surface area. And when companies um, sell these products, they, they palletize gypsum, there's a cost involved to that. I understand that you probably are asking this because it's easy for you to spread it. So if that's the case, I, I just don't know what is the answer. You have to decide how much more you are paying uh, for the palleted gypsum. But the purity should be the number one consideration for you because that would affect your rate, whether it's powder or whether it's palleted. And then if I could, you could actually spread um, powder farm gypsum or beet lime for that matter with a very crude manure spreader. You could do that. If you want to go sophisticated, then you have to have the spreaders with spinners. So, and, and um, if you were asking about the quantity, I won't be able to tell you the quantity. My number one suggestion would be take a soil sample. And I would also want to clarify that I hear these comments once in a while that can we just apply one to two tons of gypsum? Well, if you do not have the need, if your soil calcium levels are way higher than say magnesium and sodium, then you do not need gypsum. And if you still apply, gypsum is also a salt. So you're basically adding salt to your soil. So first determine the need. Then it would be a question of, um, how high your sodicity level and how high is your CEC. So the formula would determine that. I'm not gonna say these formulas are set in this stone and they give you the perfect picture. Sometimes you could get away by applying a little bit less. Sometimes you may have to apply more, but they're good guidelines. So I won't be able to tell you about the quantity. Soil sampling would be the best way. Abby, I think you wanna talk, mention yeah. something. Um, have you ever used that gypsum requirement app that Tom DeSutter put together? I'm guessing you had part, were involved in that too. Um, I haven't used it much, but there is, if you go in the app store, there's a gypsum, it's called the gypsum requirement, uh, North Dakota State University app. And that may be a, another place to kind of play around with rates and, and figure out what, mm -hmm. what you need. But it looks like you have to have soil bulk density information, CEC, gypsum purity. Um, and also SAR or ESP. Um, yes. Yep. So it, it will boil down to sampling. Bulk density um, sampling is slightly difficult. Uh, but if you have the actual bulk density of the site, that's wonderful. But otherwise that app actually assumes some bulk density, but you got to have exchangeable sodium percentage or ESP or SER, they're the same, you only need one of the tests and they're exchangeable. And uh, so the app lets you pick one of those. So you got to have those, um, either SER or ESP and then CEC. And then always utilize true CEC because um, I've done some calculation for the sake of fun, which may not be fun for you because even if your SER remains the same and if you increase your CEC, that would increase the rate 
um, I'll say gypsum per acre. And you, you, in reality, you don't need that. So the general CEC uh, you see on their soil test, that is that is that should not be the number you should be using to calculate the rates of the amendments. The true CEC measured through sodium saturation method. And I think too, we've done some work, you know, on main campus with the percent sodium that you can get in the kind of bottom right hand corner of your AgVice soil test and how that correlates with SAR. Um, so SAR is, you know, takes a while in the lab to do. So if you need kind of a quick estimate. Um, of something to at least just get a starting point. If you look at the bottom right hand corner with the percent sodium, um, if, that should be pretty well correlated to SAR. So, um, so maybe, you know, when you get down to the calculating and the ordering of the lime, you may want to use SAR or have that test run. But I think you could get a pretty quick, quick value also from the percent sodium and plugging that into this, into this app too. There is a, Abby, there's a uh, equation which is in Tom Deesetter's publication. And that's in one of our publication to soil testing problematic areas. So if you wanted to convert the percent sodium number, say in SAR, you just put that number uh, in that equation and it'll, con it'll basically give you a SAR number. So then you can utilize that. So any studies being done there that tile water is going and what is it is doing to these areas, water sources. So we do take water samples from our, um, uh, the pump, which is pumping out the water that goes into a drainage that goes into our Langdon water. And to be honest with you, um, there, there, there have been no issues so far. And the reason being that all of these uh, salts or contaminants get very diluted when they are coming out of the water. But if you let the water sit for a long time, say in a pond, then there would be probably over time, you know, some of the salts may settle down and then accumulate there. Uh, but if just the water is flowing, um, then there would be no issues so far. Abby, you have anything on that? Um, I don't. Our where we have tile installed in some of our studies, it, it hasn't run. The tiling hasn't actually been running. Um, probably this year it has, and we've collected samples from that. I just haven't seen the data, but um, and that that's in a high clay soil where we're seeing uh, where we're just not seeing it run. But um, but yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add to that, Naeem. I wish I did. Yeah. So the second comment is also very important. I've had producers that wanted to drain the tile into a livestock. Now that's a totally different thing because I know there are some um, elements like say sulfur, for example, uh, you, you wanna be careful about that. So yes, um, we haven't had a issue with this site, but each site is different. So yes, you do not, without testing the water, um, you know, I would not advise just reusing that water for livestock consumption, even for human consumption. Uh, basic point is each site is different. So whatever is coming out of the water is basically coming out of that soil or the site or the field. Get, get one sample tested. Um, the best time to take a water sample is when it rains a little bit, at least half an inch and then you take the fresh samples. When we take samples from here, we take samples from downstream, upstream, and from the pumping station. And it's a painful process, I'll tell you this much. I send these samples um, because um, we send them to uh, Department of Health and they are like dissolved phosphorus. We have to filter the water and then we have to have some acids in them to preserve the sample, put them with ice packs, send them through overnight delivery, but we get it done. Talking about PP. It all depends upon your soil and what objective you have. If you have soil without any salt or sodicity issue, no problem areas, essentially then um, you could plant anything. Everything will grow there. You, so you have no limitation. And then what is your objective? Do you have livestock? Or you just wanna improve soil water infiltration, add some nitrogen? So I, 
here in Cavalier County, we do not have a lot of livestock. 17 was the year when one person, farmers, soybeans got hailed and he just wanted to have a cover crop mix, but he wanted to be, it to be very cost effective. So it was a three day mix of chickling vetch um, and then turnips. And I think it was forage barley. 14, 15 bucks, and he had phenomenal growth because he planted it in the last week of July. But if you have a saline spot, then we are talking about a different mixture. Uh, forage barley, forage oats would be more salt tolerant. Uh, beets are more salt tolerant, but they don't do well in a mix. So it all depends upon your site um, and then your objective. Abby, you want to add something to that? Yeah, I think a lot um, when I consider what to plant on PP, I also look at weed pressure. And so if you have a field that has, um, has quite a bit of weed pressure and you feel like you need to have a herbicide pass uh, throughout the, you know, sometime in the, in, during the summer to control those broadleaf weeds, you could just seed something like, like cereal rye or oats or just barley or a mix of those if you want, but having just the grass there so you have an option to go over and spray with a with the herbicide may be useful. Um, if you have fields that are less that have lower weed pressures and you feel like you can get the field clean and then come in uh, with, a, with a diverse mix, then I'd say go for it and start thinking about what, what Naeem is talking about with the objectives and what you wanna do and, and what your price point is. Um, you can do a lot of things with a fairly cheap mix and fairly low rates. Um, so as he's saying, talk, a lot of guys talk about turnips and radish, but I feel that's not diverse enough. And, and that's true, uh, David. I think um, you know turnips and radish can be good because they're small seed and they can just be broadcast on the surface. But I think you want some kind of uh, small grain in there, um, especially if you're going to corn the following year. Um, so what happens when you have species like turnips and radish that that are non-mycorrhizal, so they don't form that association with, on their root with the fun with the fungal hyphae that corn needs for phosphorus uptake the next year? You kind of lose that priming effect in the soil, and so um, so you can see phosphorus deficiency in corn the following year. Um, I think, you know, in radish and turnips too, when they, when they decompose um, over the winter, if, if it's an open winter and we don't have a lot of snow catch, you're not going to have a much residue uh, to protect that soil from erosion either. So, um, so throwing in some kind of grass would be a good idea, whether it's oats, barley. Um, you can seed cereal right early in the season and it will stay very low and um, until it vernalizes um, over the winter, it won't, you won't get a lot of growth on it. Or will you get decent growth, but it won't be the tall rye that you imagine. It won't, certainly won't head out. So, um, so I think those are really good options to include with turnips and radish. And, and honestly, with, with turnips, unless they're going to graze it, I don't typically recommend turnips because they're a higher likelihood of over, overwintering than radish. And so if they, say, go to soybean on that field the next year, they may get a bunch of turnips on their cutter bar. So, um, so I would stay away from turnips unless their their intent is to graze it and just use radish and some kind of um, some kind of grass. I think would be fine. Yeah, I think we have a, a prevent plant um, link on the NDSU Soil Health webpage. So if it's right on the homepage, and there's all kinds of prevent plant information from. Um, from insurance companies, um, from uh, guidance on mixes, some videos from the Soil Health Minute where we looked at, at diverse mixes versus single species. Um, and if you are gonna graze it, we have some information on grazing as well, if, that, if those dates change uh, for prevent plant like they did last year. But good questions. I think, you know, I think in two when we're when we're looking at a prevent plant situation, it's it's not, I don't wanna say a free year, um, but it's a year where you can really get some diversity in there. You can get some different roots in there. You can, um, you know, it gives you an opportunity to do a lot more with a mix than you could traditionally after, after wheat harvest or something like that. Um, so I think it's a good opportunity to really maximize your efforts um, in building your soils, but. I would also add that, um, you know, prevent plant, uh, with the prevent plant acres, whatever you're gonna plant, you're gonna get the best out of it. Most of the time, we have a short growing season, especially here around Langdon. And if you are planting a cover crop mix after August 10th or 15th, to be honest with you, most years, we will not get growth more than six inches, for example. 
the producer, the example I gave it to you, he planted that mix in the last week of July. And I don't know, it was the growth like two, two and a half feet tall. And he actually was worried in the fall. <laughs> he was worried. He said, there's so much biomass. Would I be able to plant the crop next year? Everything turned out to be fine because he had a legume in it. So the carbon to nitrogen ratio was ideal and everything broke down during the winter. But I'm just telling you, just a difference of uh, four or five weeks can make a huge difference. So I understand that may not be an ideal situation for you. You may want to plant a regular annual crop. But if you have premium plant acres, that's a great opportunity for you to add diversity and you will get very good growth from that cover crop mix. So I'm seeing here too, David responded again. He doesn't have a lot of produce, producers with a lot of cattle, um, but he's just trying to set, find something more effective than turnip and radish. Um, used rapeseed in the past, but they took it out with a lot of guys planting corn the following year, um, which makes sense. Rapeseed can overwinter and, and it um, flowers and grows very early in the spring. Um, so it can be challenging to manage. Um, but yeah, I, I think something more effect. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that doing something more than turnip and radish would be, especially if they don't have livestock, I'd pull the turnip from that mix. I'd use some radish. I'd, I'd uh, for a legume, if you want to put something in there to fix nitrogen ahead of corn, um, I would go with a pea or, or a faba bean or something like that. We don't get a lot of, I mean, we'll get growth out of clovers, but I'm not very impressed with clovers for the cost of seeds. So uh, doing something like, like peas, maybe a radish, uh, throwing in some kind of grass in there. Cause we know, um, the other thing we know too, is that we talk about radish are always fixing compaction, right? And, and we talk about being a compaction buster, but um, but in talking with Aaron Day and things that I've seen in the field as well, that you get a lot more benefit out of a fibrous fruit of a grass for relieving compaction than you do that radish. So, um, so having the combination of the fibrous root in there as well with some kind of uh, small grain would be good. Um, we've got common vetch works well in South Dakota too. Uh, Stacy, you're braver than I am. I stay away from vetches in general. <laughs> um, I don't know why, I'm just kind of a scaredy cat, but I, I've, yeah, if I do use a vetch, it is common vetch as opposed to the hairy vetch. Um, I've just seen hairy vetch take over so many fields and, and I'm just not psyched about it. So yeah, Stacy says she doesn't use hairy vetch at all. Um, you've probably heard it called scary vetch too. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I think you could throw in a common vetch if you want. I've just had really good luck with peas and I've, I've seen a lot of great things out of peas. Uh, but make sure you inoculate. If you're gonna use a leg, you inoculate it so that you get the full benefit in that field. Uh, we have had good luck with chickling vetch. I haven't tried the common. And the only reason we went with chickling vetch because the far producer wanted to lower the cost of the seed. And I just literally went through the cost sheet. And I realized that hairy vetch was like $2.60.70 per pound, whereas chickling vetch was 70 80 cents per pound. So we replaced it. We got the good growth. And he hasn't complained um, at all about um, chickling vetch becoming a problem for the crops later. I also want to throw in something, um, somebody made a comment, I think David, that they don't have a livestock. So that producer doesn't have any livestock. I asked him later, we didn't really um, keep a record. In 2018, I think he planted canola there. And I asked him, did you see any benefits of you know, he just basically let all the biomass go back into the soil. He said that he didn't cut back on the fertility of canola. He applied the regular fertilizer rates, but he said he got his best ever canola crop from that field where he had the cover crop three-way mix, 14 to $15 per acre, but planted in end of July. And he said that cover crop mix did something um, and again, I'm not trying to say we don't have any soil data to prove and fertility takes time to mineralize and everything, but that cover crop did something to that field. 10 or 12% higher yields with same inputs. So Naeem, when you mentioned canola, it reminded me that, um, that also because of disease transfer and some of these full season cover crops to say a canola crop the following year, you really want to watch what you put in there and probably not include um, things like radish. Brassicas, brassicas yeah. especially. Yep, club root is a big issue here. Uh, so we would, basically they say no brassica at all. 
There is uh, another comment. <laughs> Stacy with the Harry Vetch in 2008, and it's still there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not surprised, Stacy. Every time I see Harry Vetch in a field, or if it comes in in a little bit of seed, it's like, oh gosh, I just. <laughs> Not one of my favorites. And I think, you know, for the PP stuff, I think we, Naeem and I are talking about it before we started this webinar. We'll be doing some um, additional uh, webinars or just conversations, question and answer type things on that coming up. So, um, and Joe Eichley will be part of that also, our weed specialist. So I think um, keep your eye out for that and, and, um, yeah, we'll just kind of figure out when to start that because um, I know I, I agree a lot of people are thinking about PP and and it's just it's it's not worth it in some cases to mud things in and um, have a, a mess so, um, so David I um, I'll quickly give you my um, viewpoint on that and then I'll let Abby share hers so that producer um, uh, the example I gave you 2017 so in the fall we were and I have some pictures and I'm six feet tall and I'm telling you that I, you cannot see me below my vest. Like it was, uh, I think, two and a half feet tall biomass. And he got worried. So I talked to another neighbor who had livestock, but there was a water issue. So he couldn't bring his livestock. So then we, he was literally worried. So I wanted to help him. So there is a tool. Uh, which is called um, it's K line agriculture and they have they call it trash cutter. Um, so basically that tool chops up uh, and you could you could utilize it um, even when you have wheat stubble, for example. So it chopped everything on top of that field. And it was about 500 acres we are talking about. There was nothing in the spring. But the key is you got to have you know, good C and ratio. If it is all brown, the residue is not going to break down. But this was lush green and there was nothing. And I'll tell you one more thing. You guys, I think, have more warmer weather in the south than us. So you, you should have more microbial activity compared to, say, uh, that field is around Osnabrück, which is 10 miles east of Langdon. And we have our own pocket. When Dave Franzen, he gives the fertilizer recommendation, he has east and west of North Dakota and then Langdon. So we have a totally different climate here, a little bit more colder. So I would say if your CN ratio, David, is right, um, and if you chop, chopped it up or something, I don't know whether how much of a difference chopping up made, but basically it's all about soil contact. And there was nothing in the spring. So he did that in 2017 fall. In 18, it was all gone. So if you chopped it up and he didn't till the soil so that um, you could watch it on the YouTube. It's called Trash Cutter. They named it Trash Cutter. I don't really like the name, but um, K-Line Agriculture's Trash Cutter. If you chopped it up and if your CN ratio is one to you know 10, like you know below 30, then you should be good in my view in a normal year. Yeah, I think, you know, as you're saying too, um, you know, the spray and then till, uh, I think I would just express that a lot of these cover crops, I mean, everything rots better in the ground where the microbes are. And so working up any kind of cover crop, um, not only do you lose the moisture usage of that cover crop, but then you lose um, any structure that it built and then you're putting all that organic material on the surface and it's a lot harder to decompose the material on the surface than it is by leaving it in the soil where, where things can work on it and decompose it. So um, I do have growers that, that have sprayed out cover crops in the fall because they're concerned about moisture that it's drying the soil out too much and they, they feel like they won't have enough the next spring. And I think that's fine. You know, if you do go out and spray it and that's their major concern is that they're on sandy soil they're, they're concerned about moisture the following spring is, you know, say they burn up a lot of moisture this summer and we don't get any um, going into next spring. Uh, I, I think that that's okay. Um, I certainly wouldn't go in and till it um, because it, it will affect the decomposition of the, of the cover crop. Um, but I don't know. I, I think it's best to just not, not add that cost of spraying it out, let it go. Um, 
let it decompose in the soil and, and, and see what you have the next year. So you're saying guys are, are worried that if they don't till, they will be too wet the next spring, hard to change your mind. Yeah, I, I should put out there, we have some data that we collected from a full season cover crop. And we had these plots where we had full season cover crops, and then we had plots where we had just kept the soil uh, tilled all summer and bare. And it was interesting because where you had the cover crops, you saw this really nice, I'll try to do this into the camera, but you saw this really nice, um, just gradual decline in soil moisture with depth because you had these roots going down to four feet and we had all that moisture usage with depth. And then on the, uh, on the ones where we just had bare soil and we let it evaporate, you had kind of drying at the surface and then there's this bulge of moisture right underneath that. And then it was, it had to climb with depth because it couldn't move down in the soil. Um, and so I think, you know, if they, if they, I would just have people that, you know, if you have a full season cover crop field or some way to show how that moisture usage is more uniform with depth when you have something growing like you do having a crop growing, um, you know, tillage, all it does is dry out the surface. And, um, and I think, I think we need to make sure that we keep all those core, those pores that are, that are from, you know, intact from the surface all the way down into the profile. We need to keep those intact and not make them, you know, something that the water has to move all around through these disjointed pores to get deeper. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tough to change, to change that because, because there's a lot of fear. Um, but we're seeing it successfully in a lot of fields. And I think we just have to come up with more scenarios or more pictures or more cases where it is working um, to give people the confidence to, to leave it out there. I would also say if we do the tillage, so the pores which have been made during the growing season in the root channels will basically be closing down those channels. So if your channels are say six inches deep, and if you tilled even the two, three inches deep, you're basically closing those down. So you're gonna be negatively affecting the infiltration, say in the spring when there's melt going on. I try to convince my wife not to till last fall, leave the mulch. And, you know, we have other disagreements, you know, and uh, two days before she observed something. So there were some gardens in our neighborhood. They tilled it in the fall. And two days later, after our argument, she said to me, you know, I went around that garden. It's like mucky. You know, you cannot even look at it. And our garden is dry. I can walk over it. And I was just smiling because... I basically, I told her the same thing, not do it. It just, it takes sometimes some courage to try these things. And I understand that, you know, um, you know, Aaron Day, which, which was our first webinar, the presentation, he talks about the same thing. We want to dry out the uh, soils faster so that we could plant early. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the, his data shows that if you do that, if that soils, essentially you'll lose I think it was 15% of the yields because of that. And so basically we'll be defeating the whole purpose. We want to get out in the fields early so that we could plant early so that we could have better yields. But if you're losing the yields because of that, to be honest with you, I'll wait. So, but like Abby said, we, we just got to have some um, good examples and one thing, David, I would suggest to you that if you wanted to uh, tell them the same thing, how about if you tell them that they could do whatever they want on their, you know, main acres, but how about leave a small field and try to do something different, small area, 10, 20 acres, and then compare it, you know, that, that would be the best thing to do because then the stakes are not that high. And if you get good results, then you know, that may help change their minds too. It seems like some of these things are easier to try to on your worst acres that you don't have very high expectations for anyways. Um, so I don't know, you could, yeah, I agree with that. What Naeem is saying, you need to have something so you can, so they can experience the, the changes that occur with these practices. But um, yeah, it's tough. It's hard, to, it's hard to show some of these things until you're actually in the equipment on the field experiencing the structure and the um, and the roots of the of a full season cover crop any other thoughts or questions oh here we go hypothetical here 
if I have a producer that is having a tough spring with a high moisture, is it worth trying to convince them to have a cover crop mix and include winter rye to eat up some of the moisture the following spring and then crimp or even spray the next spring and plant through that? I know it's another big step for guys that don't have any experience with cover crops and can't stand to see their fields go up and up, go into winter being covered. I would, I would include cereal rye on that. I would, um, I definitely would. If you can get that cereal rye established and kind of sell them on the idea of planting green. So you're, you're using all this moisture with your cover crops. And if you want, you know, something in there to help manage the moisture next spring, when you have the residue, then, then shoot, go for it, have some rye in there. Or if they're, I, I, I would, I would do it. I think that if they're going to soybean the following year or intending to go to soybean the next year on that field, um, I would include cereal rye in it and, and have that carry over. Um, just make sure they're not going to go to wheat on that field or corn because um, that adds a whole nother management. Um, well, it'd be difficult to grow wheat on cereal rye and corn adds a whole nother step of management. But, but yeah, that's what I would do. Or, you know, I, some growers I work with that they want the full season cover crop mix and then they'll actually come in in the fall and seed um, cereal rye into that full season mix to have a really good stand of rye the next spring. So it's a two-step process, a little tart, tougher to convince to do that, but, um, but yeah, that's what I would do, especially if they have multiple years of high moisture, what, what do you have to lose by trying it? You know, we've tried everything else and it's not working. So, you know, give it a shot, see what happens. But I think, yeah, typically that planting green of having a winter annual, some kind of, you know, cereal rye, winter, winter wheat or something like that over winter and planting into the next year feels like the easiest sell to anyone. Um, so I'd say go for it. Let us know how it turns out. If that's the excess moisture issue, I think planting green would be the best because we want to kill the rye if we think that it's going to use some water, which you want to want your actual crop to use but Abby you have successful experiments where you planted green and then came back and then killed the rye correct yeah yeah if we have enough moisture there um, especially in a higher clay soil that has high moisture issues repeatedly um, then that's a great approach but on a sandier soil we're terminating the rye early to make sure it doesn't use up too much moisture in that seed bed um, but yeah I mean rye is such a great tool and you can start I mean we've seen Benefits starting around 40 pounds is usually where I see farmers start it if they're seeding it. Um, 40 pounds seems to be a good starting place. And some of them have, have stayed at 40, they've dropped it down to 20, some have gone up to 100. Um, you know, it's just then they can get a feel for it. But I think, I feel like 40 is just kind of a good, a good place to start. Um, and say, so yeah, David's saying a lot of people are in panic mode and want a solution. I want to change their conventional ways. A lot of producers experience too much moisture, but are not convinced that the plants will eat up as much moisture as what tillage can do. Um, boy, yeah, plants are pretty amazing. I mean, we use them as crops to move moisture. And so, you know, if you can actually have a denser stand of plants out there, I, I, I just, I mean, imagine what, what kind of moisture you can use. And so it's a lot of, yeah, like you said, just a lot of changing kind of the thought process and, and that's Naeem's in my job too. So we can, we can kind of work on that and see what we can, what we can produce. I'm kind I mean, of I'm I'm bummed I won't have the soil health minute this summer um, that won't be on TV this summer but uh, but it doesn't mean that we can't get some good video and, and whatever else too of, of some of these cover crop uh, fields. Abby I, I just have a quick question. Um, um, winter rye I, uh, I think the difference between cereal rye and winter rye would be that winter rye oh, sorry cereal rye is easy to kill correct? Um, so cereal rye and winter rye are actually the same thing. Um, and actually Marisol cringes every time I call it cereal rye, but that's what everybody's kind of calling it. Um, okay. It, should, it really is just the, the difference. The, the main differences between the rye plants are winter rye, cereal rye, and just rye are like winter wheat or whatever else, you know? I mean, so, so that's one, you know, it's a cereal form of it. And then there's the rye grass. And rye grass is what we ask people to avoid because it can become a weed. Um, so, so yeah, the rye grass is more of the forage, the, the, the winter rye, cereal rye, or just rye is more of that, uh, grain. So, um, so yeah, Marisol tells me, I, 
if you talk to Steve's winger who breeds this stuff, he calls it winter rye. Marisol calls it cereal rye just because because she wants to make sure that people know what we're talking about, but it really is just a, it's just rye. Um, and the other thing I would say on the same question of drying the soil quicker with the tillage, I think again, Aaron Day's presentation has some um, good slides about, you know, how soils warm up, comparing chisel plow and then uh, some other tillage implements. Uh, so let's see, so Nathan says he seeded rye on a lot of PP acres last year. I may not get it planted this year either, but my neighbors may not either. I have something actively growing now and my neighbors do not. So Nathan, I know a lot of farmers that are in the same situation and they are really glad they have the rye out there because those are fields that they're not going to have to deal with. And honestly, they're going to take it to, to harvest and sell the seed. And, and so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, it's kind of nice to have those checked off the list and you've got something growing and using moisture. And, um, you know, we've, we've heard from some people that, well, the, the soil is still really wet under the rye and it's like, well, it's wet everywhere. And, um, but at least that acre seeded, it's going to manage weeds. And um, so that's awesome. I, that's good that you did that on your PP acres and now it's, it's growing. And I'd be curious to see um, now that it's vernalized, um, what kind of, what kind of yields you get off of it or how it, how it establishes and, and I'm, I'm guessing you're going to take it to harvest um, unless it dries it out enough that you can get soybean in there or something. But, but I think there's, that's great. I like that. I know a farmer with over 500 acres like that this year, and he's just really happy that he doesn't have to deal with those acres. Mm -hmm.